Let's begin. So welcome everyone to the inaugural seminar of the Linguistic Justice Society. This is a webinar series dedicated to the um, topic of linguistic justice. I am Singyun Song. I'm a PhD fellow at Kaya Leuven. I just submitted my dissertation on linguistic justice and structural injustice. I'm one of the four organizers of this event. I will just uh, briefly, uh, I will just invite the, the organizers to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, Matteo, do you want to start? Oh, thank you, Sangyan. I'm Matteo Bonotti. I'm a senior lecturer in politics and international relations uh, at Monash University, Melbourne. I, I work on linguistic justice issues, particularly in connection recently with uh, political parties and party politics, but not only. I also work on other areas of political theory, such as political liberalism, theories of public reason, food justice, and free speech. And I, I'm very happy to be involved in the seminar and in the organization of, of this webinar and the activities of the Linguistic Justice Society. Thank you. Ethan? Sure, my name is Ethan Nowak. I'm an associate professor in philosophy at Umeå University in Sweden. And I work, I guess, in the philosophy of language. Some of my work concerns formal semantics, uh, in particular, where indexicals and demonstrative expressions are concerned. But I think the most interesting strand of my research has to do with linguistic justice in the uh, philosophy of language, in the tradition of the, of the philosophy of language. So I have some work on language extinction and current projects on sociolinguistic variation, dialectical diversity inside of a language, social and political questions that are raised by the fact that um, there's more that we do in speaking than transmitting information understood in classical philosophical terms. I'm very excited to be here today and I, yeah, I look forward to the discussions. And Filippo? Oh, sorry, can I just say too that we, we've decided uh, as conveners to uh, implement a system whereby we prioritize questions during the Q&A from junior uh, researchers. So if you're a PhD student, or an early postdoc, and you want to be a part of this priority queue, send me a private message in the chat, and I'll arrange, uh, I'll, I'll randomize a list of people and pass it to Sunghyun, who's chairing, so that she can appropriately prioritize. Great. Um, Filippo? Yeah, hi. Uh, nice to see everyone. I'm uh, Filippo Contesi. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the University of Barcelona. Uh, I work in the in the Logos Research Group in Analytic Philosophy. I uh, work on uh, the intersection between linguistic justice and philosophy. So the um, sort of relevance of uh, uh, linguistic justice and the predominance of uh, English in contemporary analytic philosophy. And then I also uh, work in aesthetics and philosophy of uh, emotions. Great. So yes, we are the, the organizers of this event. Um, today we have Professor Yin Ying Tan, uh, who is an associate professor of linguistics and multilingual studies at the Nanyang Technology and Technological University in Singapore. But before I introduce introduce uh, Professor Tan properly, I also want to just explain the context of the webinar a little bit so that we get a sense of where we are coming from. So we are members of the Linguistic Justice Society, um, which is an international research society that aims to promote the coordination of all the research carried out by the scholars who are working on the issues of language, politics, and ethics. And our mutual aim was to connect different scholars together and to disseminate the research in both academic and public arena. And um, the society began in September 2021 with the kickoff workshop dedicated to the issue of linguistic justice and migration in Kai Leuven, where I organized with my um, supervisor, uh, Helder de Scooter. And since then, we have planned uh, many events, such as annual conferences, which is upcoming in Liberate the next one, as well as other events. And this webinar series is one of our events. So I already shared a link in the, in the chat box, and I think Matteo will repeat it. Um, in, in the link that, uh, that we will share, you can also check out the, the rest of the, the schedule for the webinar series. Um, now I will introduce Professor Tan. So as I said, she's a Associate Professor of Linguistics um, in Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, she works on language planning and policy, and she is also a sociophonetician who, is, who has published in Accents, Prosody, and Intelligibility. Um, she focuses on languages in Singapore, 
um, especially English, Mandarin, Chinese, Malay. And um, her work has appeared in top tier journals such as International Journal of the Sociology of Language, Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development, and so on. Um, today, she will give a lecture titled Doing Justice to and in the World of Englishes. Her lecture will take place for 40 minutes, more or less, and we will have five minute break, and then we will proceed with the Q&A session. Uh, please keep in mind, as Ethan said, we have a, a particular um, way to prioritize the junior scholars in participating in Q&A sessions. Um, just send Ethan uh, an email, uh, so, sorry, a, a private message here on the chat, and we will give you priority. And before you speak, I think you have to um, uh, request to uh, the organizers so that your mute is lifted, as far as I understood. So let's keep that in mind and proceed. Uh, Professor Tan, would you like to begin? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sun Hyun, And thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. It's really nice to be speaking to a group outside of linguistics. Um, linguists are very boring people, so it's really nice to be able to share some of these ideas that are pretty much dominant within the field, but I thought it might be nice to have an interjection from with people outside the field and see if we can do some kind of cross fertilization. Okay, it's storming really badly, so if you hear thunder, it's not my fault. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, doing justice to and in the world of Englishes. And just from the title itself, I think you can tell where I'm coming from, that um, I work in the field of world Englishes. And I'm a linguist who, is, who has preference for empirical research. And so my influence, or rather the, the, my work in linguistic justice is all thanks to Helda, not because I was very much into it to begin with, but just that we had long conversations and we see points of intersections. So what I'm planning to do today is to try my best to sort of give an overview of what I think the problems are and possibly some solutions and also to offer a methodological approach something that's more empirical that we can therefore see a link between um, what has been pretty much a normative approach to linguistic justice and what I think we can offer as in the field of linguistics with uh, an empirical um, evidence of some sort. Okay, so I mean, everyone knows this, um, okay. Um, so I don't need to go into the details about what Van Perez has talked about for linguistic justice, but we do know that he's offered a whole set of solutions, I think, for the question of injustice or linguistic injustice. And one of the solutions that he's proposed, of course, is English as a global lingua franca. And um, for that, I think pretty much we all know his stance is that the ship has sailed, pretty much. Um, English is already there, just use it. It's it solves all kinds of problems in the world. And predominantly, we can see the three approaches that he has, or the three arguments that he's put forward for English as a lingua franca. One is that you have monolingual English speakers and they can subsidize non-English speakers by providing them with free information on the web, for example, and a whole range of other very interesting solutions to that in his 2011 volume. And then we can also think about English as serving an instrumental function, both in terms of global communication and also communicative exchange. And that hasn't changed very much. I think we see this happening all across the world. So we can think about ideas such as taxation or universal minimum wage as a form of compensation as what he has suggested um, in his work. And also we can look at the preservation of local languages in terms of the preservation of dignity based on the principle of territoriality. And so in a way it doesn't sort of hurt anyone given that English is already there. But we also have scholars who have been predominantly uh, against this particular solution. And in fact, in the 2015 um, special issue on the critical review of international social and political philosophy, we've seen half the papers there sort of charging against this particular proposal. Um, and in particular, Stephen May, for example, highlighted how it's a very simplistic advocacy for English as a global lingua franca, primarily because of the inequality issues and power dominance that English has over other varieties, even though 
the key word here that he has noted here is that you, we have English language varieties. So the charge so far has been that um, the question of linguistic justice and English as a solution, in fact, it's not a good solution simply because there are going to be people still going for the high status language varieties. I'm going to come back to that in a bit to see how we can get around this problem. So that's one and it's a very heavy charge, I think, and something that's a little bit difficult to get out of. And the second one is that English is really a global product. Some people call it a hyper collective good in that the more, people walk, the more people speak it, the more people want it. And to some extent, you will have um, high-powered countries then pushing for English speaking or English classes as a kind of an enterprise. And this obviously then leads to further resource injustice because the more people can offer, the more people want to buy into it. And then the heaviest, I think, charge against English as a global lingua franca comes from Philipson and Philipson and his other work starting from the 1990s um, all the way to 2006 is repeated this ad nauseum that English really is an Anglo-American Frankenstein, he claims, and he pushes for the idea that English as a global lingua franca really is a form of linguistic imperialism and specifically an English one. So we have a whole set of problems here with um, English as a lingua franca, where you have two different ways of looking at it. Philip Van Perez talking about it as a solution to the world's injustice and a um, whole bunch of other people thinking that it is a problem. And I'm not saying that it's not a problem. I'm just saying that we may want to reframe the issue and think a little bit more about it. So this is where I come in. And I propose that the solution possibly can be found if we look at the way um, linguists have talked about English across the different um, periods of time. And I think about English research or English language research across three different paradigms. Uh, it started somewhat pre-1970s, and this is a very old framework. I'll just briefly talk about it in a bit. And then we have the old world Englishes paradigm that's really the dominant one in the 80s, started in the 80s and it's still very dominant today. And the more recent one um, started in the 1990s with the ELF framework, English as lingua franca. So we see these three paradigms. I actually haven't seen any new paradigms coming up. So um, we can sort of approach this particular question by looking at the way English has been thought about and has changed over the period. Okay, so I'm going to take you on the tour. So the very old approach, really, about very common approach is what we call the ENL, ESL, EFL distinction. Very old, but very intuitive. And people still use it. If you just think about the way universities have listed courses or people just simply give labels like, oh, you're an ENL speaker, you're an ESL speaker. Um, and this has its origins in possibly it's been dated to 1970 in Strang's volume, History of English. But rather, the idea was propagated by Cook and Greenbaum, who are really the authoritative English grammar textbooks, if you so-called. And um, they really propagated the idea starting from the 70s all the way through to the 2000s. Of course, this idea has sort of lost steam a little bit because of the world English's paradigm. But very much people are still fixed on the idea that there are geographical boundaries where speakers of English just are. So if you're, say, in the UK or in the US, then you are supposedly English as a native. You, English is your native language, therefore English as a native speaker, and so on and so forth. So if you're from a place like Singapore, for example, then English is a second language. But that kind of approach has been proven to be somewhat derogatory. And it's also not very fair to English speakers around the world and certainly very old fashioned as well. Okay, and a host of problems. So we're not going to be dealing with that too much. But I think the main objections to Van Paris's idea of English as a global lingua franca pretty much has been stuck with this particular idea that people think about English as this one language and that it, they belong to the so-called native speakers. And native speakers as a concept is highly fraught, as we all know, um, but there are ways to get around it, okay? 
Then comes the World English's Paradigm, and it was made famous by Braj Khatru's Three Circles of English, and we think of him as the godfather of um, the World English's Paradigm. And this started, in fact, it was a whole series of work back in the 80s where people wanted to come up with a model to go against the ENL, ESL, EFL distinction. And that idea was not bad at all because certainly people thought about how the geographical boundaries were not accurate in trying to determine one as a native speaker. And so Braj Castro came up with this idea, which was one of the many different models that were in currency at that time. But this model took off for various reasons. One is because of the way he's aligned the circles, right? So you have the inner, the outer, and expanding. In, at first glance, you would think about this as corresponding to the ENL, ESL, EFL distinction, but to some extent, it's also a matter of framing that he thought about the inner circle as not terribly important because they are simply there as a kind of a core. But really, the focus is on the outer circle Englishes places like India, Singapore, Nigeria, and also the expanding circle like Japan, China, Greece, and so on and so forth. And the idea of the circle also allows for fluidity, which means that no one's fixed in that particular circle. People can move across circles. And this idea has taken off um, quite substantially and it's been developed over the last 20 years. And Katru himself came up with a new volume of how he redefined terms of looking at world Englishes. So even the term world Englishes is fairly recent, I would say something like the last 15 years or so, when previously people thought about the outer and the expanding circle as new Englishes. But they're not new anymore because things have gone further. So what we see here is really a conceptualization of Englishes, not just as one monolithic English, but multiple Englishes. So we think about World English's paradigm as I, try, I was trying to capture this in, if you notice, I like trilogies. So I have everything in three points. So the World English's paradigm in, in, in like three major key points really, is that nativization really is a necessary linguistic process. What that means is that whatever that you get in a new English or world English is a product of a natural organic linguistic process. Things happen because languages come in contact and that you get new ways of capturing the language and therefore you have new codes and new norms. And these norms are not bad, they are just different. And in fact, they can become norms of which then everyone needs to partake in and share. And two is the whole idea of culturalization within a national boundary. And this whole culturalization happens not because it happened by accident, but because there are very strong efforts, both from the point of view of the state when they put in place language planning and policy, and also participants of language communities who then take some agency in working with the institutionalization of English. And that means dealing with language on an everyday basis, having language or English across multiple functions and across different domains. And that makes a huge difference in terms of how one thinks about the use of language because suddenly it's no longer just someone else's language, but it's now your language to some extent, which then takes me to the third point, identity construction is an absolutely critical aspect of the world English's paradigm. People do not simply just give up identities. In fact, identities are constructed, you build new ones, and you can in fact build a new one using English, which has been part of you now, given the first earlier two points, nativization process and the culturalization process. So speakers now have agency and they are able to then identify themselves, not just as English speakers, but also as a particular kind of English speaker and that they identify within the community of speakers and therefore have ownership. And I'm going to talk about ownership in a bit. Now, the third framework, which is the L framework, and um, Scooter talked about it in 2018, a fascinating paper, and um, it's going to like have some kind of uh, cross-reference to that at some point. But um, L came out 
as a resistance against the world English's paradigm. And it's a very interesting paradigm only because it claims to be very modern and it also claims to be very non-judgmental, which fits very well with the way we think about the world, right? We don't want to judge people. Um, not that world English's paradigm or world English's people do. In fact, I think on the contrary, people don't. But Elf goes a step further by saying that it's not just about the outer circle, which really shouldn't be talking about hierarchies of inner, outer or expanding, but rather to allow and give power to every single person who's using this language. So truly English as a global lingua franca. So this kind of came out of this EFL idea, which was started by um, Jennifer Jenkins, who's based in Southampton. And Jennifer Jenkins was originally thought to be a World Englishist person. And she was, in fact, a World Englishist person for a very long time. Until in the mid-1990s, she said, no, let's focus on the EFL. But to very cleverly turn this around and just simply call it ELF, right? So EFL becomes ELF. Um, it's very sexy and very cute. Um, and it sort of caught on and had a whole bunch of followers who then expanded on this idea, the key one being uh, Barbara Seidhofer, who did a lot of work on ELF by coming up with an actual corpus, which was the Vienna voice corpus that recorded Europeans speaking English, whose first language was not English. So this was said to be a movement that was led by World English scholar and therefore World English, um, world English influenced. Um, but um, we see a whole bunch of people now jumping on the bandwagon of ELF and saying, oh, we are all ELF speakers and therefore power back to the ELFians, as I call them. I don't know, ELFs, ELFian, whatever. So what exactly is ELF? ELF is defined as English as it's used as a language among speakers from different first languages. So presumably, if I now make a claim that English is not my first language, I am now using ELF. Okay. And even if you claim that English is the first language, and if I'm interacting with someone whose English is not first language, then we are also ELFing, so to speak. Okay. Um, and Seidelhofer sort of supplemented that by saying that any use of English among speakers of different first languages would therefore be considered elf speakers, simply because you don't really have any other choice. English becomes your only mode or medium of communication. So elf is a nice way of thinking about the, the kinds of different communicative modes of people. Should I take the raised hand or not? Some here? No? Oh, okay. All right. So what are the key characteristics of ELF? And this is where the main distinctions, um, this is how it differs from the world English paradigm, is that ELF really is a transient encounter. I, ELF is not an English. Elf is not a variety of English. In fact, the elf people will say it is not a variety, which is point number two. It is a lect. So we all have idiolects. So I speak in a particular way, that's my lect. You speak in a particular way, that's your lect. And if we happen to sound fairly similar, then we are engaging in a simulect. This is what they claim. So it is idiosyncratic, it's not developmental, which means it can change at any point of time. And that makes ELF extremely attractive because no one is bound by any rules of grammar or any kind of code that one needs to engage with. And how do we then think about ELF is that it is a moment of interaction. So I think about it as literally taking a snapshot where two people are now talking and we take a snapshot of that and we can therefore analyze how that elf encounter looks like. Um, this is very much in vogue right now in the field, um, especially with the translanguaging people, um, obviously key people like Li Wei and Li Wei in UCL and Ophelia Garcia in um, New York University. And they've been talking about translanguaging since like 20 years ago. And now people in linguistics who believe in translanguaging don't even bother to 
define it. It's just like, you should know, we are all languaging. Um, and this particular idea of languaging just means that there is no concrete boundary to what a language is. And I think Sue Wright talked about that in response to Philip Van Perez as well, that how do we tell what is a language? A language is not really a language. We are just simply languaging. And L sort of takes on that idea as well, because it's not English English. Let's just not call it English. It's just L. So what exactly is ELF? ELF is nothing except a particular moment of which an interaction takes place. So it's free for all in a way. So it's highly democratic and it's also non-judgmental, which also means that the way we can think about ELF is really just through an orientation and mindset. No one sets the linguistic agenda. Everyone's on equal footing and all it requires is mutual negotiation and effort, but it is not a language. So the language can be used in this case. So what the Shkuto did in 2018 was to look at linguistic justice and ELF, and he compared in, in particular um, ENL and ELF, which is very interesting. And since we are talking about two completely different paradigms, ENL as a framework taken from the very early um, days of Englishes, and ELF in the very last days of it. And he analyzed four injustices and in fact argued that ELF reduces, but really does not remove the injustices connected to English as a global lingua franca. And I totally, totally agree with every single one of the argument made there. Um, but I think though, that if sort of one takes ELF as really just a moment and not an object of analysis, that, that may change the story a little bit. Okay. So to kind of, I'm going to wrap up quite soon, I think. Scout so take us back to where I started off by saying that I think linguistic justice really has been, and it's been proven to be a very much um, normative approach and in some sense, best practices. That and it's also been engaged by scholars outside of linguistics, even though the term linguistic isn't in linguistic justice. Um, I'm not blaming anyone. I think linguists should be blamed for this because linguists don't necessarily want to engage too much with normative issues. Um, but I'm thinking, I'm just testing this out, and this is what the forum is about, to kind of think about these three main like tenants of Vampire's model of linguistic justice in terms of fair cooperation, equality of opportunity, and maintenance of self. Um, and I'm just going to put that out in the open here as fair cooperation as a kind of a resource justice. So if you lack fair cooperation, therefore resource injustice, equality of opportunity, a kind of communicative injustice, and maintenance of dignity. If you don't have that, then there is a self injustice. Right. So, I mean, I don't need to repeat this because everyone knows this very well, but I'm going to sort of just take these three points and see if there's a possibility of testing them out and to see that if there is an empirical approach, we can sort of try. So I'm trying. So I'm a linguist and I said I worked with empirical data. So what I did was I ran a sociolinguistic survey and I ran it over two years or so, this was pre-COVID. And I had quite a large number of participants, close to 3,000 of them. Um, many of them are university students because they were easy to get. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with Singapore, we have three major ethnic groups, um, the Chinese, the Malays, and the Indians in fairly unproportionate um, percentages. So the majority, the dominant groups, the Chinese group, so people like me, and then you have the Malays and the Indians in the following order. Um, so what we get in terms of language policy is that we have an English plus bilingual policy. So English is the official language of the country. Everyone needs to learn English. And you also have to be assigned a mother tongue. So my mother tongue is not my mother tongue. My mother tongue is given to me by the state. So my assigned mother tongue is Mandarin Chinese because my father is presumably Chinese, uh, according to the state. And therefore, he was given the mother tongue Chinese, even though when he was born, he certainly could not speak Mandarin Chinese, neither could my grandfather. But 
that's besides the point. Point is we all have these two languages that we have to learn. And I've written extensively about how English pretty much has dominated the entire scene in Singapore here. Um, so the current data set is also going to have the same kind of findings. But what I want to sort of draw your attention to is the ability to test out Van Persis' three ideas of linguistic justice by just sort of asking some questions in a slightly different way. So the question of fair cooperation, so I've asked them, like, you know, um, how should the government invest in people and um, the government must invest more in the teaching of Mandarin Chinese, Malay or Tamil, or invest more in the teaching of English. And you can tell like the overwhelming percentage um, of the Chinese, Malay and Indian speakers, in fact, think that there really should be more investment in Mandarin Chinese, Malay and Tamil. But very few of them, in fact, only a third of the population there believe that there must be an extra investment in teaching English. So what we can see here, there's actually no extra burden for English to be used and taught. In fact, Malay, Mandarin and Tamil require more resources in some sense, okay? And there's also idea of equal opportunity, English as capital as we know it. You ask them, is English useful for work? Oh, hell yes, everyone says that. Is Mandarin useful for work? To some extent, yes. Is M Malay useful for work? Yes. Is Tamil useful for work? Absolutely not. Only 29% of them say so. But is being bilingual absolutely important? Yes, thing it is. So what we can see then is that English creates equal opportunity for employment. In fact, it's not just equal opportunity, but absolutely essential for e employment here. It's a no-brainer, but I think what it does say is that it can be tested out in some way. But of course, being bilingual is a distinct added advantage advantage to this. Okay. And the third one, which I think is possibly the most exciting one, is the idea of the maintenance of dignity. Um, is English your language? And people have talked at length about this. Widowson has sort of um, gone on quite a lot about idea of linguistic ownership and how there really should be some ways of defining ownership. Um, Barbara Seiderhofer herself in her exposition on ELF also talked about ownership as an important aspect of ELF because in some sense, everyone needs to have a sense of ownership. And no one has quite really pinned down what this ownership means and also who can make claims to own a particular language and how. So what I have here in the survey is just basically ask them like, what is what do you think is a language that you feel is your own? And we have all kinds of responses and certainly English and I put English, Singapore English, Singlish as a one category because um, for this purpose, for the talk of this purpose, there's no need to sort of break it up further. But you can see an overwhelming majority of them think about English or Singapore English of some sort as their own language. Mandarin, Malay, and Tamil, not much at all. In fact, very, very small percentages think about them, even though it is the second or rather a core first language that they actually have to learn. And it's also tied very strongly to their ethnic identity, as well as the idea that is their state assigned mother tongue. So what we see here is that English, not the other three languages, uh, is in fact critical to the building of their identity, not just a national identity, but also a kind of self-identity. So that takes us to the idea of linguistic ownership. If this is not linguistic ownership, then what is? And in some sense, it also important to now think about what exactly linguistic ownership looks like. So in 2019, I have a paper on the idea of linguistic ownership, but I talked about it in relation to the idea of linguistic insecurity. Um, but what is kind of important to note here is that we can think about linguistic ownership by drawing references from scholars who have alluded to this issue to some extent. And linguistic ownership can be thought about in three ways. One is the ability to speak the language, to the confidence in using the language, and not just confidence, but also confidence in 
passing judgments or deferring judgments from others. And finally, the most important thing that's coming up over and over again is the idea of identity. That linguistic ownership is something that you can own, that a language is something you can own when it becomes part of the identity that you not only create for yourself, but also identified by others who share in the same community. So if we think about linguistic ownership in this way, then where does ELF stand and where does World English's paradigm stand in relation to the question of linguistic justice? So I think, and I will really wrap up now, really, is that the problem of thinking about English as a global lingua franca, as people who are against the idea is simply because they think about English as a monolithic entity. And scholars have written about this, people have resisted this. Uh, Stephen May himself has written about this whole idea of varieties as with many others, but no one has in fact come up with a very strong case for saying, let's resist this idea of a creature called English. Um, and world Englishes help us get around the problem because what we can now do is to contextualize Englishes, not as one thing, but as multiple varieties based in multiple sites. And this kind of idea or the development of Englishes, because it is part of a idea of ownership to some extent, that it allows people to create the language or to partake in the language practices based on their own beliefs. So if it's not power back to them, then what is? So where does ELF stand with this? Is that, remember, we talked about ELF as a movement. And ELF, because it's not anything, it is not a code, it is not a language. And ELF remains at an abstract level. To some extent, it is good to think about ELF as a snapshot but a snapshot doesn't allow us to go beyond the construction of something that you can lay claim to because it's ultimately transient and it's always a moving target. And no one, in fact, not, ELF has tried to come up with a set of rules for what ELF looks like, but that set of rule changes all the time. And again, it's not something that people want to follow as well because they are also resisting the idea of creating a code. So you can't have it both ways, which means to say that ELF remains abstract and an abstract entity is still an entity as opposed to thinking about Englishes, which then allows you to think about multiplicities. Um, I like the Scrutus claim here that World English's movement is about nationalizing language, but ELF is about globalizing language. And I'm going to throw it out there because it's just kind of an idea that isn't this kind of cool that when you're nationalizing something, it's like a national boundary kind of a territorial idea that it perhaps helps in allowing us to think about the maintenance of the different Englishes across the world, because we don't necessarily need to be tied to that one thing. And the two final points, identity construction really is an important aspect of esteem. And again, this brings us back to the idea of dignity and justice, injustice of self, that to some extent, world Englishes provides for these esteem, but ELF does not believe in identity construction at all. In fact, there is no such thing as an elf identity. You can't even have varieties. So what are you? You are just an elf. So as you are partaking in this elf interaction, that identity disappears because it's supposed to be fluid. And if it doesn't give you any, then in fact, it's denying that sense of identity as well. And finally, for linguistic ownership in elf, the logical consequence of the argument is that if ELF doesn't belong to anyone, then no one owns anything, which of course is true. But we want that kind of ownership because that ownership is also what allows us to then take into account the different forms of justices that um, Van Price has put out for us, okay? So what are the advantages of this account and why the world English paradigm, I think, may possibly provide a solution to the issue of English as a global lingua franca. 
in and by using a uh, an empirical methodological approach to this is that it expands the linguistic debate outside of uh, the linguistic justice debate outside of Europe. And we look at the way post-colonial ecologies where English has developed all over the world. And you can now start to see an intersection between how the so-called ENL nations thought about English and how the world has developed where Englishes have in fact um, grown organically all over the world. And finally, I think this is this then becomes a cross-disciplinary conversation that is not just simply normative or abstract, but there is a possibility for it to be driven by empirically, like empirical sociolinguistic data. So thank you very much. I hope there will be questions. Thank you.